Thanks, folks. Okay. So, um, a decade ago, I was sat on my own in this semi-derelict data center in, uh, in Manchester, um, bootstrapping an open stack public cloud on a rack of second-hand hardware bought on eBay. And over time, we rebuilt that data center, we built a team, and we built a real platform with real customers. But there was no Kubernetes, there was no Docker. Um, everything was pretty good for its time. Everything in version control, orchestrated using Puppet. But there was lots of brittle bash scripts that needed regular tending. And we took that platform through the ISO 27001 security certification. And the experience of managing security back then was pretty difficult. There was lots of manual work, um, external scans using things like Nessus, custom vulnerability checks in Nagios, and very limited tooling for automation. And the point of all of this is that the cycle of technology change moves pretty fast, and it's only getting faster. Um, the difference in the next decade is likely to be significantly bigger than in the last one. So I'm going to talk about five things that could potentially change the way we think about security um, even more dramatically over the next 10 years. So at this point, a huge disclaimer. Um, this is in no way a prediction um, or investment advice. Um, history is littered with examples that most things in technology very rarely go in the direction we think they're going to. So you're going to hear an awful lot about keys, about certificates, and about signing this year. And it's a fairly safe prediction that uh, artifact signing in our software development lifecycle is going to become pretty much standard. And um, public key cryptography has served us well for more than 30 years. It's underpinned all of the innovation in the web and internet space. Um, but there may be problems in cryptography approaching. So this is a quantum computer, and quantum computers not only look cool, um, but they work very differently to classical computers. Uh, they replace the idea of bits, our zeros and ones, with quantum bits or qubits based on the properties of quantum mechanics. And unless you're a quantum physicist, most of quantum mechanics is completely mind-bending for normal humans. Um, but most folks might be familiar with the concept of Schrodinger's cat. Uh, this is a thought experiment about a hypothetical cat that can be both alive and dead at the same time um, whilst it's in a sealed box with a fatal radioactive element. And it's a pretty macabre example, but it does illustrate how particles can be zero or one or both at the same time. And it's this superposition phenomenon that, that quantum computers are based on. And quantum computers are theoretically very good at certain classes of problem that are very hard for classical computers. And factorization of prime numbers is one of these. Um, this is a visualization of Shaw's algorithm developed in the 1990s by mathematician Peter Shaw. And it's widely viewed as a proof that quantum computers could potentially break public key cryptography, including uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchanges and algorithms like RSA. And this might be theoretical, but some researchers think that this could happen in the next decade, on a day known as Q-Day, when most of our cryptography would be broken. Um, our certificates would be vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks, and our encryption would be cracked. Now, there's a lot of different actors involved in building quantum computers, including nation states and three-letter agencies, so we may never actually know that this has happened. And it's serious enough for governments to take action with a move towards new kinds of algorithms resistant to uh, this threat of quantum computing, post-quantum cryptography. And in the US, NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, has been running a competition for the last few years. And the algorithms were selected in 2022. And uh, they've all got very cool names. Um, any algorithm with a Star Trek reference has got to be good, right? But at some point, it's likely we'll all need to switch our keys, our certificates, and our infrastructure over to these new methods. So um, coming back to signing, I don't want a sec. 
And once we start signing everything, what we're really doing is building chains of trust. And the reality of any chain of trust is that there has to be something at the bottom that we can actually trust. And it's obviously very important that we trust our build systems, the things that produce our artifacts. And there's a couple of different dimensions to this. The first being, can we trust our build to always produce the same thing? Now, this may be, may be kind of non-obvious, but there's not necessarily any guarantees that the thing you're building is exactly the same every time you build it. And if it's not exactly the same, then you can't really guarantee its validity. Even slight differences may introduce unexpected behavior or even new security vulnerabilities. And this can happen if you're using timestamps, if your ordering is volatile, and for a whole host of other reasons. So how can we ensure that our builds are completely deterministic? Well, this reproducible builds concept has been around for a long time, and it aims to do exactly that. It's a set of software development practices aimed at creating bit-for-bit -bit identical artifacts every time we run the process. And lots of large open source projects already practice this, but we again hit the issue of what can we trust? If we use pre-built binaries in our build pipeline, can we know that those aren't compromised? And with that in mind, some folks have started talking not only about reproducible, but also bootstrappable builds, where our entire build chain is also built and can be verified. So before we build, we build the thing we use to build, but where does that actually stop? Can we trust pre-built operating systems? Now, there's a train of thought that even the smallest general purpose operating system is now too big to be auditable and verifiable by a human. And there's lots of interesting work happening in this space with projects trying to build the smallest possible thing that can boot hardware and build compilers which can then build other things and so on. And these are generally written in low-level languages with the aim to be human auditable. So at least some programmers are capable of reading and understanding the entire code base. And we're talking about really, really tiny in the order of a few hundred bytes. So now we're really off down the rabbit hole of trying to find something somewhere we can ultimately trust. Um, even if we can boot hardware with something tiny that we can fully audit, can we actually trust the hardware? Now, you might say at this point that no one cares about hardware anymore, right? We're all in the cloud. But the cloud still and always will be just someone else's computers. And the world of silicon is notoriously proprietary. There's lots of proprietary features built into modern chipsets that you may never even know about. And in the hardware space, we're operating almost entirely on trust. Uh, not just the chips themselves, but all the tooling to design and build them is also proprietary and unavailable for us to verify. And that's one of the things that's driving the creation of open source silicon. Um, and there's lots of interesting projects in this space, um, from open risk with the aim of creating a fully fledged open source processor to more specifically security focused um, projects like Open Titan, who are building an open source design for root of trust chips and um, for validating hardware and software. And these projects are all about having those designs available for folks to verify and audit. And there's an argument to be made that computer architectures have remained relatively unchanged for more than 30 years. Yes, they've got smaller, they've got more powerful, but fundamentally the way the CPU works, virtual memory, paging, multitasking operating systems are all quite similar. And we're still using the same paradigms in programming. And these architectures have features that could be considered contributory to certain classes of vulnerabilities, particularly around memory safety. So are there changes in computer architecture which can reduce the attack surface? Well, there's a team at the University of Cambridge in the UK who've been developing a new instruction set, Cherry, Capability Hardware Enhanced Risk Instructions, which is designed specifically to mitigate software security vulnerabilities. And the way Cherry works is by introducing a new set of processor primitives that provide a mechanism for fine-grained memory safety and process isolation directly in the hardware. 
So it's a combination not just of hardware but of tool chain support to reduce the amount of vulnerabilities that an attacker can exploit. So basically the idea of least privilege but highly scalable, highly efficient as it's done directly in the CPU. And Cherry's been around as a concept since around 2010, but there's now hardware that actually supports it in the form of this ARM Morello board. And there's lots of development going on to widen the ecosystem of software support for this new architecture. So we've talked about cryptography, we've talked about build systems, we've talked about hardware and architecture, but the real elephant in the room is the rise of artificial intelligence, and specifically large language models. Now, unless you've been living under a stone, um, you will have seen a lot of traffic about ChatGPT since it was released back in November. And the growth in users has been unprecedented and millions of people have been trying it out. And you know, whatever your, your feelings about ChatGPT in general, if you actually used it, it's clear pretty quickly that this technology is going to be uh, truly transformational for how we interact with computers. Um, entire industries are gonna be disrupted by these abilities to write complex text based on limited human input. And pretty quickly after the release, people started to experiment with having ChatGPT write code. And again, the results here have been pretty extraordinary. Given relatively small inputs, ChatGPT is already capable of writing mostly correct complex applications in multiple languages, manipulating data between formats, and translating programs between different programming languages, and even writing programs in fictional programming languages. And whilst it's not about to displace programmers just yet, um, the field is moving incredibly quickly. Um, we're really only a few weeks into the AI revolution and it's already clear that it's gonna drive massive change. Um, these models can't reach out to other systems yet or to the internet, but that'll almost certainly change. And a lot of researchers have been talking about the idea of conversational programming, where we interact with models based on what output we need and not on how to achieve the result. And the AI model will get to that result by any means it deems appropriate. Um, but this raises some kind of fundamental questions about the future of application software. If the future involves computers writing programs for us, where we only really care about the output, then the question arises about why computers would use high-level programming languages at all. Um, computers don't know anything about programming languages. Languages are basically abstractions to make it easier for human programmers to program computers. Everything's either interpreted or compiled down to something the computer can actually run. So since such a huge proportion of our issues with software supply chain at the minute come from how we assemble applications from packages and libraries, um, perhaps the era of AI-generated programs will solve that problem for us. Uh, most likely, though, it just introduces a whole new raft of security issues. We're still back to our starting point about trust. Can we trust our AI model? And more importantly, is it plotting a robot takeover of the human race? So to return to the disclaimer, um, some or all of this talk is highly likely to not come true. Um, predictions are notoriously difficult in technology, and yes, this was me 30 years ago, so what do I know? Um, but I'd like to leave you with a quote from that famous futurologist, Dr. Emmett Brown. Um, your future is whatever you make it, so make it a good one. Thank you. Okay.